Hello, my name is Holly Eddie Vane. I'm a senior consultant at Benari Partners. Uh, we are a boutique executive search firm. Um, we are globally focused and we have different uh, business areas, one of which being life science, which is the area that I specialize in. Uh, we help businesses right the way from, um, you know, stealth phase right the way through to IPO. The reason that I wanted to do this topic of uh, female representation in life science investment is because investment is at the beginning of it all. You know, these therapies don't get to bedside, these, these technologies don't um, aren't able to help people in their lives without them, of course, being invested in, in, in the first place. So I think it's important to discuss um, how few women there are in this in this field and um, you know also give women a chance to broadcast their achievements their successes uh, provide any advice for those aspiring or just generally those that want to find out a bit more about it I think uh, the, the way that I wanted to make this interactive is by including interviews with several people that I've worked with in, in my network and you know those that have got say 20 years plus experience in life science investment and different innovative biology technologies um, and yeah just give them a sounding board really and a chance to uh, to educate those that would find uh, the topic interesting. The first interviewee that we have today is Lauren. She's the entrepreneur in residence at Wild Cornell Medicine. I wanted to get her involved because she's got a very long-standing career of over 20 years across multiple funds. She understands exactly what it takes to succeed in this space um, and this interview provides good context around that and uh, advice for those aspiring. So yeah I hope you enjoy. So thank you ever so much for joining us today. I'd uh, like to introduce Lauren Busby. She's the entrepreneur in residence at Wild Cornell Medicine in New York. Um, if you could just uh, give an introduction, um, Lauren, and a bit of an overview of your background. Hi, Holly. Nice to be talking with you. So I have had a uh, very long career in the venture capital industry, which I started right out of college. And I've worked with three different venture capital funds, some of them more generalist funds, but most recently a specialist fund focused on healthcare. And we were a uh, transatlantic venture fund doing deals in both Europe and the US. And uh, uh, since that time, I have been working as a company operator in a number of different med device, digital health and therapeutics businesses. Okay. Could you um, tell me about some of the deals that you've worked on throughout your uh, career in venture capital? Yeah, happy to do so. I've been very lucky to be involved with a lot of smart people. Mm -hmm. And my career as a generalist gave me an opportunity to invest in a number of different interesting technologies. Uh, this was uh, before I became a specialist. Yeah. And uh, while I was working with a very generalist fund, I actually invested in a company called Americaid, also known as Amerigroup, which was a managed care company focusing on seniors, uh, the disabled, and low-income people. And uh, I learned in that particular deal that you can actually make money in a capitated environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, the investment was made in the mid-1990s. The company went public in the early 2000s. And in 2012, it was purchased by Anthem. So uh, you can see that that was a successful deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also involved in uh, early on in a company called SpectraCell Laboratories. And that was a spin out of uh, some technology from the Clayton Foundation of Research in Texas. It was a proprietary blood test that measured uh, functional intracellular deficiencies of vitamins, minerals, et cetera and an individual's metabolic processes. Um, and that company is still alive today in Houston, Texas. Uh, when I was with the Transatlantic Venture Fund, we invested in an Israeli company called Sightline Technologies. And that was a flexible endoscope for uh, colonoscopy procedures. Uh, that company was sold to Stryker in the mid 2000s. Uh, and finally, uh, I would like to highlight a company called BioArray Solutions, which was a molecular diagnostic system for pre-transfusion characterization of blood samples. And that thankfully was sold to Immucor in the late 2000 period. Great, impressive. And um, in terms of the uh, therapeutics-based biotechs that you've worked with, have you, have you done much there? 
Yes, we invested quite a bit in therapeutics when I was with the Transatlantic Venture Fund. Um, that wasn't an area where I specialized, mm -hmm. but we did invest in a number of uh, transactions there. I am currently working with a couple of therapeutics businesses out of Wow Cornell in the immunotherapy space um, when it has a particular uh, cardiac therapy for those who are on cancer treatments and another company out of NYU that is working on um, protein, uh, protein therapeutics for different neurodegenerative diseases. Okay, excellent. What have you seen of late in the industry then in terms of trends and uh, any insight you can provide into the competitive landscape? Yeah, the industry is uh, it's coming off of COVID now, coming off of the COVID highs. Yeah. And what I was just reading about yesterday, in fact, in CV Insights, um, was that the transaction levels are falling. In other words, fewer number of deals are being done, but the values and the, the amount of capital being invested in those deals is really uh, increasing in some cases deal volume by dollar was up by 25, 50, 75% in all areas, digital health, med devices, therapeutics, health IT. So I think what that says is investors consumed a lot of deals during the COVID time period when values were low, and it's very advantageous for them to do that. And now we're coming off of that big meal and people are taking a look at what's in their current portfolio and saying, okay, these are the firms that I want to support. And they're putting big money behind those, what I'll call mid-stage deals. Right. So less deals, but larger sums, essentially, and, and a bit yes. more aggressive yes. landscape. Okay, interesting. And um, in terms of the opportunities or solutions uh, that you've, or tools rather, that you've seen in the industry to, um, to provide women um, access to you know the tools themselves and also the chance to practice um, you know have you got any any examples of, of that yeah well we're working on a very innovative program right now at Wild Cornell Medicine I work with the BioVenture eLab there which is an accelerator for not only Wild Cornell Medicine but for its sister organizations Memorial Sloan Kittering and Rockefeller University mm -hmm. and um, with while Cornell, we have put together a 12 month program where faculty members and researchers participate in monthly seminars. And in those seminars, we're focusing on skill building for leadership skills, risk taking skills, decision making skills, and providing them a opportunity to practice those skills in a um, let's call it a non-threatening environment and to learn from others, other mentors who come to give talks. Um, myself and my colleague, Jahan Ali also uh, do practicums with them. And what would you advise companies, for instance, that would like to do something similar or implement that into their own um, you know, circumstances? Yeah, uh, it, it doesn't take a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. it, you can put this together in your organization and uh, it can benefit a lot of people. We've chosen to keep it small because it's our inaugural cohort, but it could easily scale. We've got 12 women and it could easily scale to say 40 to 50 women if we had you know, more opportunity to bring to, the, to uh, them resources like mentoring and that kind of thing. Since it's just Jahan and myself, we've chosen to keep it small and intimate and uh, test how this particular program works. At the end, we're having them conduct surveys. They do some journaling. It's a real learning experience. We want them to be able to um, practice what we're teaching them. Yeah, well, it'll be exciting to see how that goes and, and what the feedback is. Um, uh, I guess one last question would be, uh, have you got any advice for aspiring women in this, in this space? Yeah, you know, you and I have talked sometimes about uh, specialist versus generalist backgrounds. Yeah. And I came up through the ranks as a generalist. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it was a different time though, at the time that I was in, getting involved in the venture world, industry resources were about 3.6 billion in total in the US. And now we see 3.6 billion funds. Mm -hmm. So it's a totally different environment. Yeah. Um, 
in that sense, I think being a specialist is a differentiating factor for you or women in science. Yeah. I think that's a differentiating factor. But I think you also have to practice some of the, the things that I've been talking about so that you can demonstrate your willingness to be um, to, to be on the cutting edge and be, if you want to work in venture capital, to be an investor and have those risk-taking skills, those decision-making skills. And you can do that through um, just making investments in the public market, mm -hmm. getting involved with some volunteer organizations, getting involved in innovative projects within your organization that you work at right now, and you know really take on extra uh, extra opportunities to build that skill set, build that toolbox. Excellent. Well, that's great, and uh, thank you ever so much for your time. Um, it's uh, it's excellent to have the insight of someone like yourself with such a long-standing and successful career. So, thank you ever so much for your time and uh, and all of your help there. Thank you. My pleasure. So the second interviewee is Mariette. Um, she's in a bit of a different background in the sense that she's European based um, and also she's managing partner of a uh, angel, for angel investment fund. So she helps companies to get you know, through to series A. She's really at that beginning part of their journey. She's also got a very long standing career and she provide some excellent insight into what she's seen shift through her time in this space. You know, different trends she's experienced and, and how she's seen female representation change through that time. Um, so yeah, a bit of a different context here and I hope you enjoy this one too. So I'd like to introduce Mariette. She's the uh, fund manager at Curie Capital uh, based in Amsterdam. So over to you, Mariette. Thank you, Holly. Um, yes, um, I'm a managing partner at Curie Capital, which is an angel investment fund in life sciences. And um, my background is actually a master's in uh, medical science. And uh, since then on, I've been working in business in total for 25 years now, of which the first 15 years have been in the biotech companies and also working to spinning out biotech companies from universities and heading uh, a spin-off company myself as an entrepreneur. Uh, and the last 10 years have been investment uh, business. Um, so the last three years at Curie Capital and before that I was an investment manager at Bomb Capital uh, where I invested uh, in total 25 million euros uh, in over 10 innovative uh, new startups. So in total, I've done more than 15 investments uh, in very promising uh, companies uh, developing medical devices and new medicine for unmet medical needs. Excellent. And um, how would you say your career has moved through the years? What, what advice would you give for those aspiring to move into this, this world? Yeah, I think it's a, a good combination to take the experience from the business side into uh, the knowledge uh, as an investor and also uh, representing the investor's interests in the board. Mm -hmm. So you can help with your own uh, business experience to have support and be using your network for all kinds of uh, applications or, or improvements in the company to, to support the entrepreneur. Yeah. And what would you suggest in terms of, uh, say, specialist versus a generalist background? I think in uh, life sciences, both in uh, the business side as in the investment side, it's always specialists involved. Yeah. People always have a medical background because yeah. it's very important to grow the business and the value of the companies uh, knowing what the science is about. Yeah, it all stems from that, of course. Yeah. So in terms of your uh, particular um, area, what would you suggest is um, the shifts in the investment market? What have you experienced in terms of trends and what do you think the future holds? There are a lot of companies have had difficulties, let's say, in the uh, period of the pandemic. But uh, of course, mm -hmm. uh, our business in uh, the development of new medicine has only gotten uh, a boost and at the same time uh, there is a development in the economy that the interest is very low so uh, let's say um, pension funds and, and, and wealthy people are you know taking their money to investment funds like the ones in life sciences so there mm -hmm. is a 
a large amount of capital available to be invested also. Yeah. Uh, the trend that we do see now is that these investors, uh, let's say the professional life science investors, are investing bigger tickets because they are, you know, uh, having bigger funds. Mm. And they tend to do that in a later stage where the risk has been minimalized. And this can only be done by seed investors like, for instance, Curie Capital mm. and also other more like government type of regional funds take on earlier risk to allow these ventures to come to these um, to meet these criteria of the bigger funds this yeah. could be to have their product scaled up or to have more uh, risk mitigated and on the yeah side effects of, of potential new medicine so there is a growing need for uh, seed capital funds yeah okay that makes sense and in terms of the actual industries themselves the technologies you know med devices for instance and these particular innovative uh, therapeutics that you that you invest in what would you say you've, you've witnessed in terms of shifts and trends well we invest in both uh, medical devices mm -hmm. and medicine um and i i think medical devices has a a lower capital need uh, and, and, and a lower maybe, let's say, return for the investors. Uh, whereas uh, biotech is uh, high capital intensive. You probably need um, more than uh, 100 million of capital to get a product, you know, market approved or even, even more than that. But usually you can find a pharma partner along the way. Um, uh, but you can, if, if all goes right, you can get a higher return on investment. But that is uh, the risk reward difference between the two sectors. Uh, time to market is also playing a role there because you can get a medical device approved more quickly. Yeah, through to the FDA. Um, and in terms of within the, the therapeutic sector, obviously that's where I focus myself most specifically. Would you say there's a big difference between say APIs and then obviously these new advanced therapies, for instance, that are coming through these cell and gene therapies? Yeah, yeah, there's always some new exciting uh, therapeutic advances. Um, I myself have worked uh, in the beginning of my career with uh, company well at first the, even the biologics were advanced medicine <laughs> i mm. started off uh, my first job at uh, genzyme and uh, product management but then came gene therapy and this has been a long struggle to get uh, within the interest of um investors because yeah. it was there were some yeah serious uh trial events uh, yeah really limiting maybe that big pharma would uh, buy such a company so then investors don't invest so mm -hmm. that has now been overcome this hurdle and this of course cell therapy is the next one now mm -hmm. with all these car t cell therapies being uh, of interest to investors also yeah. but curie capital has identified new areas of um, mm -hmm. uh, new medicine and this is for instance uh, our our company citra is uh, working on an antibody to target netosis which is a uh, a phenomena causing many diseases mm -hmm. and uh, there's also other interesting areas like for instance the senescent cells which are a cause of many age related diseases including cancer metastases mm -hmm. so these okay. are also uh, scientific topics which are now being interesting to to investors yes yeah, so it's almost good to go into the gray areas where perhaps not everyone's moving and identify those unmet, unmet needs um in in the kind of you know around where all of the traffic's going uh so thank you for that and i think one one last thing I, i'd like to cover really is just obviously you've had a very long career in this space um you know over 10 years how have you seen things shift between say female representation in the industry throughout your career yeah um, I think in general, in uh, let's say uh, the development of uh, new medical devices or new medicine, there's always women involved. But um, in the let's say the role of CEO, it's it's still um, 
mostly male dominated mm. um and but on the other hand if you look at the investors uh since the 10 years i'm now in investment uh, management uh the first five years was uh i was one of the guys but uh the last five years it's much more women around me also taking up partner roles so i think that is taking a natural uh increase which is uh, very nice yeah um and therefore they can also take on board roles so in the boardroom you see more females representing vcs but not so much yet the let's say the board members who are bringing on their previous ceo experience because they are lagging behind but yeah that will have its reasons i hope that also finds maybe a slower but natural growth in the future yeah Certainly. And have you experienced throughout your career particular opportunities or schemes or companies where, um, you know, the opportunity for women to be introduced to these sorts of opportunities? Have you experienced much of that through your career? Uh, I see a lot of, uh, uh, how do you say, empowerment or encouraging initiatives uh, yeah. around me. Hmm. Uh, I see also, um, yeah, a lot of dashboards uh, scoring uh, how funds do on the gender uh, diversity or on diversity as a whole. Mm. Also, government funding or EIF funding from Europe mm. is also requiring that to be uh, promoted by the investor yeah. actively. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is encouraging. But I must uh, also admit that in the business of life sciences, I think it's uh, important to get the right person course, to yeah. lead the company and make it a success. So we cannot uh, discriminate too much on, yeah. on gender. We need mm -hmm. the best person and the best profile. Yeah, certainly. It's about getting the right person for the role, right? But ensuring that people have equal opportunities and, and an equal platform to, to, to demonstrate what they can do. and. Uh, maximize on their skills but um thank you ever so much for this interview it's been absolutely superb and um it's been great learning more about you and and, and your industry in general um and yeah thank you ever so much yeah thank you bye bye so the third interview is with Sapna, who also has a long career, but not only in biotechnology, also in uh, finance. She had a long career in uh, Wall Street before transitioning over. What I enjoyed from this discussion is just its focus around the boardroom and how the most of the decisions are made here. And that's why it's so important to have female representation uh, to ensure, you know, broad diversity across senior leadership. From there on out and also you know involved in investment um she provides some really good insights into you know putting your hands up and um ensuring that you know women ask for uh, these opportunities um yeah i hope you continue watching and enjoy this next interview so today we're speaking with Sapna Srivastava, um, who is a multiple time board member on um, different innovative biology, uh, biotechnology companies. Uh, she's got a long standing career of over 20 years in both Wall Street and biotechnology. Um, over to you Sapna, if you wanna give us a bit of an introduction of your background. Thanks Holly, thanks for having me over and uh, giving me this opportunity to participate. Uh, you know, just a quick snapshot of my career. I think I spent over 20 years in biotechnology in almost the three different facets, which, you know, really enable it from my point of view. I started in academia. I have a PhD in neuroscience, after which, you know, I decided to move to Wall Street in 1999 as a biotech stock analyst and spent roughly 15 years there, you know, really working through companies in a very emerging field of biotech at that time. There were six companies and I think there are over a few hundred right now. And I worked mostly at Morgan Stanley, and then I worked at Goldman, uh, post which I decided to go and do something on the corporate side and really like, go from the advisory side to somewhere, you know, you can really get your hands dirty and really help build something. And I ended up being the CFO of Intelia Therapeutics, a leading gene editing company. And uh, really, I think, you know, got to see firsthand how these technologies enable, you know, making medicines. And after that, in some ways, I wanted to also go and do the next year. And I ended up being on the boards of multiple companies and really advising them on how to really, you know, think through strategy, think through financing and, you know, optimally position yourself for success and which is where I'm right now. Great. How did you get your first board role and what, what would you say is important for those aspiring to move into a first board role? Because it can be a bit tricky, can't it, getting that first one? <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, I think, you know, it's really interesting. So when I go back and think about it as to like, you know, what gets you the first role, regardless of whether it's the board role, whether it's, you know, an executive role, really a leadership role for a woman. And I think one of the most important things is to really excel in what you do. I think that's really, really important because when you really excel, people want you there. And I think that's the first factor. The second mm-hmm. factor, which I think is more, and, and, and that's factors common for everybody, right? And I think this is a women mm-hmm. symposium too, but to bring it more you know, directly on women, I think the second factor is really to raise your hand. I mm-hmm. think we often as women think that you, know, you do really well and that will be recognized and somebody will come and tell you, you're doing a great job and we want you to do this. What we forget is that there are other people doing a great job as well, but they're raising the hand 50 times over. Mm-hmm. And so what you see as being often just waiting for recognition, somebody else is forcing their own recognition. And I think one of my first roles came with like I was talking to somebody and I said, oh, I would really love to be on the board of a company. And he said, have you ever told anybody that? And I was like, no, I just figured that, you know, when I'm ready, somebody will reach out. And he's like, mm-hmm. you're ready than more ready than most people I know. And, mm-hmm. you know, it was just really interesting. And he connected me to a company, which was amazing. But the chair of the board was amazing and who I didn't know, but was really looking for caliber, really looking for, you know, people who can bring long-term success to the company. And it was Velos Bio. And I spoke to, you know, the chair of the board and the, well, the different people on the board and ended up being, you know, that ended up being my first board role that I accepted. And from there, I think, you know, clearly as soon as you get into the networks and that's what's so important about networks is it really, you know, opens up a wealth of opportunities. Mm-hmm. And how do you really pick up and think through that is, you know, equally important. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's just maybe that fear of not wanting to overreach sometimes, isn't it, in, in your particular roles. But I, it's, it's important to know when you're ready, I guess. But I mean, in terms of the actual responsibilities that you would take on in a company, though, what would you say in terms of experience adds, adds value and, and makes it um, you know, possible to move into that first board position? So I think typically most boards, you know, have to have a diversity of experiences. Mm-hmm. And I think they range from financing, marketing, you know, mm-hmm. entrepreneurship, yeah. really mentoring, you know, public company mentoring, experience. Yeah. I think it really, most of the companies, especially in biotech, you also require, you know, area specific expertise, you require, you require, you know, regulatory expertise. So I don't think there is one clear path for saying this is the expertise you need to have to get to a board role. I mean, I really think what you want to do is, you know, fit your expertise with the right company for the right board role, because you want to be real value added. And so yeah. if you're on the regulatory side, then you probably want to go for a company which is yeah. not preclinical, but you know, really looking at how to develop their product, you know, from phase one onwards and how to position themselves. If you're in finance, you know, obviously it starts very early in biotech. So I think it really depends on your particular expertise and the requirements of the company and how do you really position that for yeah. that, you know, how to add value to that company. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I guess the boardroom, that's where all the decisions are made, right? So that's why it's so important to have diversity in the boardroom. Um, and as you said, we, we, when we've spoken before, you've said it's important to um, to have the right split as well it, amongst senior leadership, but also diversity of which senior leadership roles are taken on by women, you know, rather than it just being one type of role, it's important to have diversity across the, across the team, really, and senior leadership. I think, you know, diversity across senior leadership and in the boardroom is equally important. I mean, I often found myself on either in executive positions or in the boardrooms that you are the, really the only woman in that room even today, right? And I think in terms of looking at that, I think it has to come from both sides. I think, and you're beginning to see really, you know, cultural shift towards that. I think women asking more towards that and enabling that. But I think it really has to come from both sides. You have to have management teams which are equally, whether it's in finance, whether it's in strategy, whether it's in business development or the CEO, be women versus I think, you know, the more traditional leadership roles of women which have been on, you know, either human resources side, equally important roles. But I think you need to expand those roles to make it, you know, where women are more well represented, both on the management side and the boardroom side. Yeah, agreed. And um, what would you say in terms of advice then for those aspiring, just as a, as a last point on the, on the boardroom and senior leadership? I mean, I think for people who are really aspiring to get into board positions, I think there are always two things to think about, right? What is your expertise? Where can you add value? And matching that up with where you should ask. And you should not hesitate to ask. Because I think I can't stress that enough. I mean, I think I found that true for my own career. And I find that true for so many people I speak to. I'm like, oh, you'll be a great fit for this company. And like, have you ever thought of that? And they're like, 
no, I really want to spend another three or four years really making sure I'm ready. And mm. I always go back to that conversation where I felt like, you know, I had to spend more time being ready. But once you get there, you realize you're far more ready. And, mm. you know, really, you have the expertise, the capabilities to deliver and really add value and not to underestimate yourself in any given way. I think really a recognition of that and reaching out and asking and ensuring people see that is almost an equally important component as building expertise. And in terms of the bottlenecks that you've experienced then, I mean, I know that we've discussed before about, you know, having children, for instance, can sometimes be a bit of a bottleneck. Um, what would you say companies can do to overcome these sorts of situations and, and, and um, you know, ensure that these don't cause these bottlenecks that they may have, perhaps have in the past? Sure. So, I mean, I think bottlenecks both on, I mean, honestly, on the Wall Street side and on the corporate side, like, I mean, where, at least in my experience, I've seen is when you start out on an associate class or you start out and, you know, early post PhD, post postdoc, it's almost 50 50. And mm-hmm. as you still keep progressing towards the ladder, like traditionally, I think you see a lot more women drop off because inherently there is this sense that, you know, the work life balance, the term which you hear less and less or more and more, I don't know, but uh, that you know, women always tend to feel like, okay, now I'm going to have, you know, one child, two child, whatever it is, I don't want to be in a role which is 24-7. Yeah. And I, again, I think it's a limitation. And I, you know, I was fortunate enough to meet Morgan Stanley and with a really great team. And I think the company wanted to implement that, the team wanted to implement that. And I actually ended up having two children at Morgan Stanley and continued to have a really good career. And I think one of the things was that the corporate was willing and two, you were willing to ask for that flexibility. And I think with the change in how people work, that flexibility has become a lot more easier to have, right? I mean, before like it was location driven, you have to be at, you know, this office on Wall Street, but now today you can be sitting in your room and for a couple hours do something which needed to you to be there in person. And I think it's made both sides more amenable. And I think what we found most is that most women put up these boundaries in their own head that they can do it, even if, you know, there was a path to that because they just thought they wouldn't be able to do it successfully. And I would really encourage people not to think that way because you know, you will find you can do it successfully both ways mm-hmm. and not to hesitate to ask for what it needs to do it successfully. If you need to work from home, if you need to like cut your hours, if you need to leave at three o'clock, mm-hmm. you'll be amazed how many times people are receptive when you ask and that it does not impact your career. Because ultimately most people want to have the best person in the room And if you can offer that and they can offer the flexibility for you to deliver, they will work with you. So it's really, you know, it's really, I think, in a way, being able to ask for it and work and find a way to get around it. And I think people should just ask for that. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And I'd say historically, it seems like perhaps pre-existing networks has somewhat hindered the amount of diversity in the boardroom just because people reach out to those they know and it's just about that that existing network I think it's important to incorporate new people right in the running and diversify or an, an expand network you have so I guess what methods have you used or would you suggest others use I mean would you say that it's worthwhile you know completing searches for it or like you know how, how would you say um it works best Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, I think working with people, you know, is always a comfort zone, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. I find myself doing the same thing. I think a lot of people find themselves doing the same thing because you you know what you know and you know that you can get a good work product, you can get a good work environment Mm -hmm. if you go with people, you know. And so I think expanding networks becomes a really important thing. And I think, again, a lot of it comes from the ability to ask, the ability to say, I can be a great fit here. I think this makes a lot of sense to me. I'm interested in letting people know because once people know, I think the networks also adapt, right? Most people are looking for the best talent that they have and increase the probabilities of success. It's really that match which has to happen because they don't know you you exist in California looking to provide that specific financing or regulatory expertise, which can add massive value to that company. So really putting yourself out and talking to people, I think really helps towards that. In terms of uh, like in the venture capital world and in the investment world, it seems like, I think I, I saw a statistic that said that in the last five years, the amount of female led funds has quadrupled. Like, what are your thoughts on that, would you say? So, you know, I mean, I have mixed views on this, honestly. I mean, I always think it's really important to have places which allow greater diversity, which allow greater you know, opportunity. But on the same side, I'm very, very driven by the idea that it really should be pure caliber and expertise because that really drives sustainability. 
I think the minute you mandate that you want 20% representation, 50% representation, I think you undersell yourself. I mean, honestly, I've never gone into a single place which said they're looking for women. I just find I don't want to be a checkbox. I want to be there because I can bring a lot of value. Mm -hmm. I want to be heard in a way which is not like, you know, we bought her in to check the box. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's really important, right? So I don't think there is a place for both. I think you need to have the forums like the Women Driven Funds, et cetera, to create a larger pool and talent of women Mm -hmm. who get that opportunity to be there. So it's a very important role. But on the same side, I also truly think that to do this sustainably, it has to be really meritocratic and really caliber driven. You have to be the best person for that position and you have to be able to show that you're the best person for that position consistently. Yeah. Yeah, so just work hard, be good at what you do and make sure you put your hand up (laughs) maybe when you're actually ready. That's probably the biggest thing I find in difference between, you know, I have third year associates who think, you know, men who think they're ready to be on boards and I'll have these super qualified women who think, you know, Mm -hmm. They spend 20 years and they still want to spend another five before they think they are willing or, you know, ready to be on a board, not willing. Mm. And I think there's a big difference in that mindset. And it's really overcoming that mindset, I think, is one of the large yeah. factors. Yeah, well, this has been great. And I think we've got a lot of really interesting insight here. So I thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, I'll speak to you soon. Absolutely. And if there's anything I can do, you know, please do let me know, Ali. Excellent. Thank you once again. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. So I really wanted to focus on the positives in this interview series and ensure that I was giving women the chance to really broadcast their experience and their achievements. Um, Things are changing clearly and it's important to capture that and um, I really appreciate the HBA for giving me this opportunity to put this together and and reach you all. Um, If you have any questions for me or any of the interviewees, please contact the details um, on screen now and um, and also scan the QR codes for the um, individual interview interviewees details if you want to get in touch with them directly. Uh, One thing to point out is that at Venari Partners we are well placed to help with these sorts of projects and and providing these equal opportunities um, across diversity and inclusion projects. Um, It's worth noting that we work on these for a lot of our different clients and um, if you'd like to find out a bit more about that please get in touch.